These days, when we talk about a Jewish state, we're referring to Israel. But that's not the only Jewish state in history. In our search for a safe haven, Jews have built states everywhere, from ancient Arabia to Niagara Falls. Obviously, none have panned out. So what were the six places that almost became the Jewish state? And why did they all fail? Number one, the ancient, short-lived kingdoms. We're gonna take it back to first century Babylonia, where trouble was brewing. Local leaders weren't doing a great job. So two Jewish brothers named Anelaus and Asenaeus took matters into their own hands. Backed by a group of young Jews, the brothers started seizing control of towns and demanding tribute. You'd think they'd get in trouble with the king for this, right? But that's not what happened. Instead, the king decided to use the brothers to send a message to his rebellious governors. He officially appointed the brothers as rulers over all the territory they conquered. Everything changed when a new general came to town because the guy had a wife and Analeus really liked her. So like a story straight out of the Torah, Analeus forced the general into battle and got him killed off so he could marry the guy's wife. Who says romance is dead? But there was a problem. I mean, other than the fact that Analeus's relationship was based on, you know, murder, his new wife wasn't Jewish. In fact, she worshiped idols and the Jews living in Analeus's territory weren't exactly jazzed about this turn of affairs pun intended. In fact, Asenaeus himself was pretty disappointed in his brother. But when he pointed out that paganism was, you know, kind of a no-no in Judaism, his new sister-in-law poisoned him. Yikes! It all went downhill from there. Analeus tried to keep the kingdom together, but eventually the Babylonians captured and killed him. And that was the end of the mini Jewish statelet in Babylonia. Next up, fifth century Arabia. Arabia might bring to mind elaborate mosques, but at one point, it too was home to a Jewish kingdom. King Abu Kariba ruled a tribal kingdom in Yemen sometime in the sixth century. Abu Kariba, like lots of old school kings, was pretty interested in conquest. After he conquered a city, he'd install a governor and move on. But in one province, the locals rebelled, killing the governor. Bad move, because their new governor was Abu Kariba's son and Abu Kariba was not happy to hear his kid had been murdered. He vowed to destroy the province, which is home to both Arabs and Jews. But during the battle, he got sick from exhaustion, heartbreak, dehydration, or some brutal combo of the three. As he recovered in his tent, two Jewish scholars came to visit him in his tent to beg for his mercy. And this is where the story gets interesting. Abu Kariba was so impressed with these two that he decided to convert to Judaism. But that wasn't enough. He also brought back the scholars to convert the rest of the kingdom. And things were hunky-dory for a while until the Ethiopians attacked. But King Yusuf du Nuas wasn't gonna take that lying down. By some accounts, he was Abu Kariba's son. By all accounts, he was big into Judaism. In fact, his name means Joseph with the long sideburns. Nice. Dunuas dreamed of driving out the Ethiopian invaders and creating one united Jewish kingdom once again. And he was bent on revenge. Dunuas rampaged across the Ethiopian strongholds, burning churches, murdering Christians, and forcing conversions to Judaism. Christian rulers had attacked Jews, and now he would attack Christians in return. He did temporarily reestablish the Jewish kingdom, but ultimately, his dream came to an end when he was killed in battle with the Ethiopian army. It wasn't long before the Ethiopians replaced his Jewish kingdom with their own Christian one. Wars of religion, never a good look. A few other temporary Jewish states popped up throughout the medieval world, but all fell as quickly as they had appeared. Number two, Ararat, New York, USA. With its countless synagogues and kosher bagel shops on every other street corner, New York can sometimes feel like a Jewish state. But did you know that there was once an official Jewish state there too? In 1825, Mordecai Emanuel Noah bought a small island just south of Niagara Falls and declared it a Jewish refuge and autonomous region. Noah was a proud American who was very much into the idea of America as a safe haven. He was also a proud Jew who saw it as his personal mission to stand up for Jews worldwide. He had heard reports of Jews being attacked in Germany, and he was convinced that he could be the Jewish savior. He tried his best to convince Jewish merchants, bankers, and farmers to leave Europe and come to his new promised land. 
After five years, he had raised enough money to bring his vision to life. The island couldn't actually hold more than 20,000 people, but Noah was a dreamer. He appointed community leaders in Europe to collect taxes from Jews worldwide. He dreamed of building skyscrapers that could fit millions of Jews. He even dubbed his self-declared Jewish homeland Ararat, a reference to the mountain where Noah's Ark landed and a nod to his own last name. Everything was in place. Mordecai held an elaborate founding ceremony for Ararat, firing cannons and strutting around in a Richard III costume. But the flocks of Jews never came. Mordecai's German Jewish supporters quickly realized Ararat was just a far off dream. Opposing politicians suspected Mordecai of trying to swindle European Jews. Rabbis worldwide mocked him as a false messiah. And American Jews, desperate to try to assimilate, saw no need for a homeland in the America they had already come to consider home. Eventually, a wealthy investor bought Noah's share of the island. It later became its own small town of 18,000, its destiny as a Jewish homeland long forgotten. Number three, Uganda, Africa. The pressure to create a Jewish homeland reached its peak in the early 1900s. A series of violent attacks against Russian Jews left millions terrified and desperate for an escape. At the same time, Theodor Herzl's dream of a Jewish state in the ancestral homeland of Israel was catching fire, but it wasn't happening quickly enough. The Ottoman Turks were in charge of the region, and they weren't too excited about the Zionists' demands for a Jewish homeland. But Jews needed a place to escape, stat. Desperate to secure a temporary refuge for Jews fleeing persecution, Zionist leaders turned to the world's superpowers. England was willing to help. Enter the Uganda Plan. The British had been trying to convince European settlers to develop territory in East Africa, but nobody was interested. So the British leaders offered it to Herzl. Sure, it wasn't the land of Israel, but at least it was a place where Jews could live in peace. And maybe that was enough for now. Zionist leaders had lots of opinions on this plan. Some felt that accepting the Uganda plan would sabotage their chances at establishing a Jewish state in the land of Israel. And the land was dangerous, filled with lions and all sorts of wild animals. Besides, the native Maasai people weren't too excited about the possibility of foreign settlers streaming in. On the other hand, what other option did they have? It was a matter of life and death. After a lot of debate, the Zionists turned down the proposal. It was the land of Israel or bust. And if they had to wait longer for that dream to come true, then they would wait. Number four, Birobidzhan, Soviet Union. In the 1920s, the Soviet president realized he could kill two birds with one stone. He could ship off his country's Jews and strengthen his border with China. Welcome to Birobidzhan. Birobidzhan was a remote, swamp-infested region of Siberia where very few people wanted to live. But Soviet leader Mikhail Kalinin found a way to spin it into a socialist calling. He would call the region the Jewish Autonomous Region. Jews would work the land and become a productive part of Soviet society. To many Jews, the plan didn't seem half bad. Here was a land they could carve into their own little safe haven, a step towards self-determination. Many were ready to take up the offer. In 1928, the region was designated as a Jewish agricultural colony, and the first 654 Jews rolled in that spring, only for half of them to desert. Much of Birobidzhan was a wasteland. Its few habitable areas were already home to a hostile population who viewed the Jews as invaders. Still, Soviet leaders pushed on and designated the region as the Jewish Autonomous Region in 1934, officially designating Jews as a normal Soviet nationality like other Soviet nationalities. The state paid for one-way tickets to Birobidzhan and around 1,500 Jews made the move. By the mid-1930s, Birobidzhan had become a hub of Jewish culture. Yiddish rang throughout the streets. The town supported a Shalom Aleichem theater and even a Yiddish newspaper. But it all came to a harsh end in 1936 when Stalin rampaged across the Soviet Union, throwing Birobidzhan's town leaders into labor camps along with anyone else he considered a threat. After World War II, Birobidzhan became a temporary home for Jews once again, particularly Holocaust survivors looking for a home. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before history repeated itself, and Stalin started jailing and kidnapping Birobidzhan's Jews once again. Today, the region technically still holds the name of the Jewish Autonomous Region, but only around 3,000 Jews remain. 
Number five, Lublin, Poland. Before the Nazis came up with their final solution to the Jewish question, they devised another plan. Deport all the Jews to a remote part of Poland. It would be a Jewish state under German administration, of course. And the Jews would work, i.e. be enslaved, for the German war effort there. SS leaders accepted the plan, shipping over 95,000 Jews to Lublin, where many died from starvation and typhus. Others were sent to forced labor camps from there. Eventually, as the Nazis turned towards their ultimate goal of genocide, the plan was canceled, and the Lublin district became part of the Maidanic concentration camp complex. Number six, Madagascar, Africa. Around the same time as the Nazis were floating the idea of relocating Jews to Lublin, France was thinking about how to get rid of its 10,000 Jews. Both Germany and France wanted their Jews far away, but not too strong or independent. One French official proposed the colony of Madagascar. The idea wasn't a new one. European leaders had been suggesting it since World War I. The Polish government even sent a commission to explore the possibility in 1937. So did the Nazis. Adolf Eichmann even prepared a report on the potential plan. It went something like this. The Nazis would forcibly relocate four million Jews to Madagascar over a period of four years. One million Jews per year. Their assets, of course, would be seized to fund the plan. The SS would govern the island as a police state, kind of like one giant Jewish ghetto. Lots of Jews would probably die, but that was fine. The Nazis would have already achieved their goal, ridding Europe of its remaining Jews. Uh, ich erinnerte mich damals, dass uh, selbst Herzl in seinem Buche, obwohl schwer von Palästina abgehend, sich mit einer Notlösung Madagaskar vorübergehend einverstanden erklärt hat, trotz der Schwierigkeiten innerhalb seiner eigenen zionistischen Kreise. The plan leaked in July 1940. In Nazi Germany officially endorsed it in August 1940, after it became clear that the Lublin plan wasn't going to pan out. It was good timing for the Nazis. Germany was about to invade Western Europe, which would give them control over hundreds of thousands of Jews. And France had fallen a few months prior, making the French colony seem like a more realistic possibility. The American Jewish Committee protested desperately that Jews couldn't survive in the harsh conditions of Madagascar, begging someone, anyone, to intervene. Ultimately, it didn't matter. The Nazis had already moved on to worse, the final solution. That was kind of a downer. Turns out the only people who should be creating a Jewish state are Jews themselves. But there's only one place where the effort has actually stuck. And that's because it's the only place we've longed for through the millennia. The only place we direct our prayers. The only place where the land is studded with ancient Jewish artifacts. That place is the land of Israel. And it's the only Jewish homeland that we need.